to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Cronin. I'm Michael Kipp. And today we're discussing the future of extinction. That means we'll delve into the five major mass extinction events in Earth's history, the current sixth extinction that is taking place right now, and possible future scenarios for both animal extinction and human extinction in the years to come. So Kip, to start, perhaps you can differentiate between mass extinction events as they're referred to in the scientific community and the typical background level of extinction that's always ongoing. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Um, Something that should just be stated from the beginning here is that what we're talking about when we talk about extinctions is the loss of biological diversity, biodiversity, uh, unique individual species or genera or some certain level of um, biological organization. And when one of those disappears from the Earth's surface, uh, or many of them, that is what we're referring to when we say extinction. And this is going on all the time. So throughout what you might call normal time throughout Earth's history, there are new species being created, and there are some species that are going extinct. And if at steady state, meaning in a world that's not gaining or losing biodiversity, these rates would more or less balance each other. Right. And, and just uh, to put a pin on it, typically a mass extinction event is more than 50% of all species, right? Is that right? So when people talk about these mass extinction events, often referring to the select big five mass extinction events in the past, uh, these are instances where, depending on which um, taxonomic level you're quantifying, uh, where you lose a huge chunk, often yet yeah, the majority of biological diversity. Here we're talking about often animals specifically. Um, and yeah, you can get 50, 70, in some cases in excess of 90% of the species or you know, genus level diversity uh, wiped off the face of the earth in often less than a million years, which is geologically an instant. That's um, amazing. So these are clearly, yes, very clearly different types of um, intervals than the background when we were saying some species are going extinct at all times. Um, This is an event, a mass extinction event, is a time where that rate of extinction drastically increases. Right. And I've heard one scientist use the metaphor of it's almost like you're chopping off branches of the tree of life and those branches and those stems of those species just cease to go on. But some of the more fundamental species that, you know, like the microbes and and those types of species, those tend to stick around more often than, for instance, some of the megafauna. Um, Is that sort of an accurate way to think about it? I do think that's a great metaphor to keep in mind, because often when we think about the history of life on Earth and you picture evolution of animals and you'll often see a family tree that looks much like the the anatomy of a tree, these branches coming out, growing as it gets bigger, new species with time, we can track them in the fossil record, we see this increasing complexity, and you you view it as this forward march in the evolution of life. But in fact, what would be a more accurate way of viewing it is seeing this vast uh, breadth at any point in time in that tree, a very wide and diverse range of life that is being chopped away at there is extinction that is removing most of those branches. So the vast, vast majority of any uh, life that has ever existed on this planet has gone extinct. So extinction is, in fact, the the rule, not the exception. Right. I think it's 99% of all species so far have gone extinct. Yeah. So it's really, I think, useful to keep things in that um, view. When we talk about extinction, it's not that this is something that doesn't occur often. It is, in fact, the background case, but it's all about the, the balance, the rate of change. Um, because, yes, extinction is a critical piece of the way that the mechanism of evolution occurs on our planet. Totally. So I think it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about what we know about mass extinction events in the past. And obviously, the current sixth extinction is a bit different, just given the role that humans have to play. But to give us a sense for how this has typically occurred in history, I thought maybe it's good just to start with the dinosaur extinction, because that's what most you know people are familiar with. And then we can talk about a few of the others. But 
So just to start, is the dinosaur extinction, is it an accurate theory to think, is, is the asteroids theory still the primary hypothesis that we have for why the dinosaurs went extinct? And also, how could a single asteroid wipe out so many species? Yeah, that's a great question and um, a timely one. It's one that's still, I wouldn't say being fiercely debated today. Um, it's still being ironed out in, in the finer details. What's really unique about this um, end Cretaceous extinction, the one in which the dinosaurs perished, uh, is that there seem to have been multiple really bad things going on uh, for the biosphere. So a, a landmark in our understanding um, of what happened in that extinction event came with the discovery of uh, in certain sedimentary layers that were deposited at the time of this extinction event, there is detected this anomalous abundance of um, a certain element, iridium uh, was the original one. There are other elements like this as well. These are elements that are not found in much abundance in the Earth's crust, they're quite abundant in meteorites. So this lent credence to the idea that there was all of a sudden this introduction of extraterrestrial material to the surface of the Earth, and all of a sudden this got found in sections, uh, sedimentary sections worldwide. So it, this all came decades before they had even found a crater identified that was uh, its right size and uh, identified as the right age to be this end Cretaceous impact. But now we have also found that, and so there is this full story now that we can piece together that there was indeed an asteroid impact of an extremely large um, magnitude that would have been devastating in a number of ways that we can discuss for the environment. But that's not the whole story. That occurred against a backdrop of a time at which volcanic emissions of greenhouse gases, most importantly CO2, were elevated quite a bit beyond uh, above background levels. And that was contributing to perhaps increasing CO2 levels, global warming, uh, climate changes and environmental destruction of, of the similar sort of the things that we were seeing with anthropogenic climate change. Very different scale in time and space. Um, but there was decades, uh, there's still, I would say, some debate going on about the relative importance of this asteroid impact. Was this just something that was at the right place at the right time, but actually it was the volcanism that killed everything? or volcanism subsidiary. And right now I would say the, the state of the art thinking is that the asteroid was the dominant control on the timing of that extinction, but maybe the biosphere was primed in a way. It was a little destabilized. Right. It was like the straw that broke the camel's back in a way. And mm -hmm. So and it really shows you what it, it takes, perhaps a sequence of exceedingly unlikely events to initiate such a, a devastating extinction, perhaps. Right. And it's a bit counterintuitive that you think if like an asteroid hits Earth, it would make things hotter with the explosion. But actually by kicking up all that dust, which prevents sunlight coming in to Earth, it actually can create sort of almost like an ice age in effect. And that seems to be a common theme, whether it's, you know, nuclear winter in a scenario where all the nukes on Earth are blown up at once or an asteroid, or even some of the super volcanism that may have occurred and, and caused a few mass extinctions in the past, that seems to be a common theme where there's more and more CO2 and then it sort of you know prevents sunlight coming in and then that can lead to a mass extinction. Um, is that accurate or is there, are there other mechanisms by which uh, species have gone extinct in the past? So you, you're touching on two interesting aspects of these the you know what people call kill mechanisms of these mass extinctions um one common theme definitely across multiple extinction events not just the the big five but other smaller such events um is a co2 increase uh, in the atmosphere which we would link to warming today um, like what we're doing uh to our climate right now, we're adding a bunch of CO2. It's a greenhouse gas. It traps infrared radiation from leaving the Earth and basically acts as a blanket. Mm -hmm. Things get too warm. It can change all sorts of things. And just the temperature change itself can be devastating to certain animals. 
Um, some animals have very carefully calibrated ranges within which they can survive. And if you change that too quickly, they don't have time to move and they can go extinct. Um, it can also initiate a cascade of other changes though in the circulation of the ocean. This can lead to a uh, depletion of oxygen in the open ocean. Without oxygen, much animal life can't survive. You can also get the buildup of other toxic um, dissolve gases like hydrogen sulfide that can contribute to killing animals in the sea. So there's this whole range of things that come along with a warming cause for the extinctions, often linked to CO2, but also um, to other greenhouse gases like methane would do similar things. And then there's this flip side, which is almost, I mean, goes in a totally different direction. Cooling is also a bad thing. I mean, really, it, most of the time when Earth is, we'd say, background state or things are good, uh, we're carefully calibrated in a temperature range. Right, that's, like the Goldilocks. You don't want to get, yeah. right, you, you don't want to get too hot or cold. And so you can also get um, cooling from things like you're saying, the dust generated from uh, an impact. We think that after the and Cretaceous impact, this would have um, blocked sunlight, not just with some cooling effect, uh, more specifically, it might have been devastating for land plants that need the radiation on their leaves so that they can do photosynthesis. And with if you wipe out that sort of uh, terrestrial plant production, that's the base of the food web, um, everything else above that, the animals uh, higher and higher levels in the food chain that depend on that would also get wiped out. Um, and there are a variety of other ways that you can get cooling to also be a, a problem. So, right, and and sticking with the end Christ, uh, uh, Cretacean period, why is it that dinosaurs died out and mammals lived on? What was it about the way mammals were positioned relative to dinosaurs that made them more able to survive? You know, there's a variety of factors, no doubt, and I wouldn't want to put my finger on one in particular, since I know this is certainly something that people have spent lifetimes you know, of their scientific careers working on. But definitely a, a, an important aspect to keep in mind is that the balance of rept what we think of as reptiles and what we think of as mammals, um, they, they were very different ecologically and just physiologically um, in the late Cretaceous. Uh, so reptiles what we're referring to often are these huge dinosaurs again you know, physiologically different in their that they're cold-blooded and so on um but a major difference maybe ecologically in how they carved out a niche how they made a living uh when you compare them to mammals most of the mammals that we know that survived from that time are very small things I and mean, think like not um, like the squirrel and ice age the squirrel sized things. Yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly um you know not a squirrel uh, taxonomically, but yeah, that sort of ecological niche, uh, things that perhaps were harder to eradicate. Um, it, it's often easier to destabilize the highest food chain levels and think more vulnerable to destruction from the, um, the foundation of the, the food web is often more resilient. Um, that could have well been a part of it or just simply the size of that not the this position in the ecological web so yeah and that's and that seems to be something that's common even with the current extinction that we're seeing right now which is that i saw that just in the last few decades the size of the average mammal has decreased by 14 percent and if you go back from like the 1900s the size of the average mammal has decreased by far more than that because essentially we humans went around and killed all the megafauna, all these giant sloths, and the only megafauna that actually survived were a few in Africa, like elephants and rhinos and hippos. But there used to be these megafauna all over the place, and it seems like the closer we get to the brink of extinction, the smaller animals are able to survive, but the bigger apex predators or not, like the woolly mammoth, for instance, are gone, and people are thinking maybe bringing them back would actually help the environment uh, to some extent. So I guess, I, I guess my question for you is, what can we learn from not just the dinosaurs going extinct, but some of the other previous mass extinction events, and what, can, what insights can we use to per perhaps improve our current situation? Well, to the first part of what we were saying, I, I think it's 
um, something worth mentioning is this disparity, this size or the ecological role of animals that do and don't go extinct. So why is it that, or what should we make of the fact that these larger, these charismatic megafauna um, are the ones that we're preferentially seeing die off right now? Um, I think this is something important to keep in mind when we are comparing the magnitude of what's going on right now with the magnitude of past extinction events. Um, some paleontologists have made the the point that the fossil record itself, when we look back at a mass extinction event in the, in the past and we use fossils coming and going to identify it, that fossil record is extremely incomplete. I mean, we can see what's going on across a sequence of um, sedimentary layers, but it's only preserving maybe less than a percent of what survived, of what was living. And the things that it's preserving, it has a much, much higher chance of preserving the ubiquitous, abundant, small you know, invertebrates are all over the place in the marine fossil record. But you very rarely see these big, you know, ichthysaurs or whatever, or Tyrannosaurus for uh, on land um, relative to, say, the plants that were making up the, the understory. Um, so it's hard. Some people actually have said that when talking about the magnitude of extinction happening right now, yes, we can quantify that lots and lots of species are disappearing. And like you're saying, we can even see this reduction in the average size of an animal in the wild today. But that might, we may or may not even be at the point where this is a detectable feature in the fossil record if one were to look back 100 million years from now. Uh, the things we would need to see going extinct right now are those base level you know, um, pieces of the of our current ecological structure. So given the marine records and the records we have on land, I'm curious about your thoughts on how does this current sixth extinction, the Holocene extinction, compare to the previous big five? Are we on par with the previous big five as far as you know the percentage of, of species that have been lost as far as biodiversity and then also the rate of extinction? Like, how do we put this current mass extinction event in context to what we've seen historically? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I would really have to follow you know, the work and the opinions of people who have studied this in, in detail. And what I am taking from them is that, let's, I guess, talk about two pieces of this. One, maybe the current rate of extinction. That we, so not yet talking about the overall magnitude that we've achieved, but the rate at which things are happening right now. Uh, as far as we can tell, it does seem that the rate at which we are imposing changes on the Earth system is, if not unprecedented, at least not a rate that we have been able to observe uh, in the geologic record. Um, we're adding CO2. We you know, have the potential to add hundreds of parts per million of CO2 on decadal to centennial time scales. Um, when we're looking at similar magnitude changes in the last one million years, I mean, there are none of that amplitude, and they all are much slower occurring over the thousand year sort of time scale. And even the most extreme events that we can look at, say in the um, in Cretaceous or in Permian mass extinctions, it gets harder as you go further back, but in things um, more slightly more recent, there's not one of the big five mass extinction events, but there's an interval called the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. This was a time about 50 million years ago or so, when CO2 levels increased dramatically uh, to much higher levels than we have in the present day. And this occurred geologically about as rapidly as we can find in any um, in any case, but this is still not decades to centuries. It's more pushing into the millennial time scales. Um, and we do see massive restructuring of habitats in that PETM, this event 50 million years ago, you see palm trees growing in modern Alaska. Um, this is a totally different world that comes and goes dramatically. You see, a, uh, comes and goes quickly and you see changes in, like the oxygen content of the ocean going uh, much lower. So I've heard the sea the level was much lower. There was more exposed rock during that period. And like, it would just be a totally different world. It just, the world can get quite different, quite fast um, in these events relative to what we see in the geologic record. 
and all, but all of that said, I still think we don't have an, an analog um, in the past for decades to centuries scale. Partially now, we, if such a thing had happened, um, it would be very difficult to in fact detect given the, the temporal resolution in the geologic record. When you're looking at an event that's 100 million years old, uh, we don't have decade scale resolution. Um, but it, it's still quite unlikely that these events were taking place on those sorts of scales because we think often they're related to slower geological phenomena like volcanic emissions of CO2 or um, geological methane emissions. And these are occurring at the fastest maybe in the century to millennial time scale, not decades. Right. Um, so it's it's hopeful in the sense that it has been worse in the past as far as how much CO2 is in the atmosphere and how warm the earth has gotten but it's really worrisome as far as the rate of how much co2 is being added and how quickly species are going extinct and biodiversity is being lost and it's it's a uh, it's just incredible how much we've changed the makeup of the earth um, i mean just to have like have a few stats just to point out so right now 96% of all mammals are either livestock, like cows, or humans. Only 4% of mammals are wild animals. So if you think about when humans first came onto the scene, it was just us and then all these wild animals. Now we've literally domesticated or have, you know, pro progenerated 96% of all mammals. And there's just this small fraction of wild animals out there. And if you look at birds, 70% of all birds on planet Earth are poultry, like chickens and turkeys. Only 30% are wild. And the ocean is pretty worrisome too because it's by the year 2050, it's projected that there may be more plastic in the ocean by biomass than fish in the ocean by biomass. So... I mean, the way that we're transforming the earth is absolutely just incredible. Like, like you said, it's something that we, there's no analog for when we look back in history. And I think it's key now maybe to point out some of the key differences between like natural extinction events that have happened in the past and what's ongoing right now. Because in the past, you know, at least in science class, like typically what, how they would describe extinction events is, oh, there's way too many of this particular animal. So you see this populations get really high and then they just crash. And then, you know, oftentimes they're able to recover and you sort of see this yo-yo effect, but sometimes they aren't able to recover and they just die out and go extinct. And if you're looking at the population of humans, for instance, it is just exponential. And we've in many ways gone beyond what people in the past thought was even possible and a lot of it's due to, you know, genetically modified food and, you know, using fertilizers in our agriculture, which I, I read one stat that if we were to stop using oil today, we would not be able to create enough food to, to feed all the people on planet Earth. So if we tried to go full, you know, not, you know, full renewable energy, like people would literally starve because we just don't have enough uh, nutrients to feed everyone without digging up oil out of the earth. Um, so I guess like when we project out into the future, if you're thinking about it from a traditional biological sense, it's like, well, clearly this population is going out of control. It seems quite likely that there's going to be a crash sometime in the future, whether or not it wipes out all humans. It seems like there will be some crash, but it's also needs to be thought of from a different perspective because we're not just some animal. We are in, in the words of one scientist, a global super predator, the likes of which the world has never seen, with the ability to modify our environment as we see fit. So I'm curious, like, how do you see, like, what do you see as the core differences between the current sixth extinction and past extinctions? And if you were to sort of think about, like, what's going to happen from here, what would you consider to, to make those predictions? Yeah, there's a lot to that. Um, one way of splitting this up, I think that's maybe useful, is thinking about what was changing the, in the environment or you know, on the planet 
that was bringing about these intervals of mass extinction as opposed to what we we're talking about more normal uh, extinction dynamics like you were saying with populations that if they get too large uh, they can experience a crash because they don't have enough resources that perhaps describes better the the sort of dynamic that's going on uh, in the background all of the time with the generation and extinction of some species what's unique about a mass extinction event is that regardless of where you sit maybe within that optimal zone of growth of population relative to resources something about the environment changes that is going across the board to all it's not going to affect all um, species equally but this is not your fault for having grown too big or too small maybe you grew too large as a population you're vulnerable when the time comes but some external factor changes in your environment making it much harder to survive doing exactly what you've been doing and this is where we see in short time frames widespread destruction across the tree of life um, what's unique about what we are doing right now what we're experiencing in this current interval of potentially this you know, sixth extinction um, is that yes there is dramatic change occurring in the environment in this case it's at the hands of you know humans in large part it's the fact that we are pumping co2 into the atmosphere it's not volcanic emission it's coming out of our combustion engines um, it's the fact that we are systematically cutting down forests instead of waiting for productivity of photosynthetic plants to decrease because of some change in the um, incoming radiation because of dust in the atmosphere so we are the agent of change in a lot of ways and what's really what ties this um, I don't know back on itself is that we are also susceptible to the uh, environmental changes that we are bringing about um, there are very few instances that you can think of in the geologic record where an organism has had such a disproportionate influence on its environment that it became a threat to itself uh, but a lot of what we talk about with will humans have enough resources to survive and will the habitat be survivable due to changes in temperature sea level so on are changes that we are bringing about in the environment um, and uh, there's a, a nice quote that I'm totally gonna forget the, the details of but it's something to the effect of uh, an organism that destroys its own environment is basically becoming you know subject to these ecological forces that are always ongoing and that the long-term sustainability of any species is such that you cannot have that effect on your environment you cannot win in the long run by destroying your own environment those those species will tend to go extinct um, so this is sort of the maybe the reckoning for mankind is that okay we can identify all of these things going on today um, we can see this trajectory that perhaps the rate of change is alarming perhaps unprecedented um, but we also then have the ability to change our course to envision a way that we can sustainably continue right so what are so what are some of the ways that perhaps you're most concerned about for what could cause a massive crash in the human population because you know like we've so far we've been able to outrun some of the difficulties and in the past like in the 90s and 80s people were really concerned about overpopulation that seems to be less of a concern now because a lot of the models we've used have shown that we'll end up peaking around 11 billion or 12 billion people by 2050 or 2100 or something like that but then it's going to decline because as countries and civilizations become more advanced they tend to have less kids and it seems like 12 billion or 11 billion is not going to be so much that the earth can't sustain it so i'm curious if overpopulation is something you're concerned about or if it's not overpopulation or overconsumption is there something else that could result in a massive collapse in the human population um, i mean obviously there's wars there's a pandemic there's potential for an asteroid and it's hard to know which of these is the most likely or the ones that we should be perhaps addressing the most energetically. 
So I'm curious, like, of all the potential ways that in the next hundred years humanity could see a massive loss in our own population, like, what are the most worrisome to you? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I'm definitely out of my league in, in picking the best of those, but by analogy to the dynamics that govern these mass extinction events in the past, um, the the trend is often that one uh, is one that when you introduce some new environmental pressure, some new catastrophic change, something that is totally um, out of the blue, unprecedented, not following from the trajectory you've been on, when that change comes fast enough that you cannot adapt, that's when these uh, extinctions are really devastating. And so trends that are, uh, you know, gradual is maybe too soft a word, but things that are incremental, growing population, the difficulty with which we procure food for our planet, um, perhaps, I don't know, maybe just seem a little less frightening or less, less apt to create an immediate massive reduction in human population than something that is a, you know, out of the blue, total change in environmental condition, like an asteroid impact, like a pandemic, you know, something that our bodies or immune systems are totally not ready for, um, something that changes the rules of the game, basically. Um, that's, I think, what it would take to do something catastrophic on a short time scale, where all of a sudden you see this drop. Not to say the other things aren't pressures that will ultimately play into the steady state, you know, population that we can maintain on the planet or the longevity of our species. Th those other factors are important as well. But. What about like, for instance, if there was ecological collapse as a result of what we're doing to the planet, could that harm us in some way? Like, for instance, if, you know, we, there's been talk about the fact that there's been pollinator decline the bees have been declining, some of the apex predators have been declining, there's been these, uh, you know, the permafrost and a lot of these positive feedback loops. How suddenly or how devastating could it be if there was some sort of ecological collapse on us, on humans? Yeah, that's a great point, one that I had was stored in my head I wanted to get on. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think where what I had just said, where that fails is... Um, in pieces of the climate system that are highly nonlinear, uh, there are these you know, things that we refer to often now as tipping points, where you can set off a cascade of feedbacks that you're having gradual change up until a point. Uh, you push the system past a certain threshold, a tipping point, and all of a sudden these feedbacks just amplify dramatically the change um, that comes. And you, at that point, you're at whim of the, the earth system to correct itself basically um, and this comes out of the fact that the, we were talking about earlier the earth is a very carefully controlled you know thermostat or nutrient stat everything about it the everything in our terrestrial marine ecosystems is carefully balanced these feedbacks have uh, developed over millions billions of years of planetary evolution um and they have some highly nonlinear features. We, and we know this for sure, actually, to be important um, in controlling the climate state of the Earth, even on the last uh, million years time scale, the moving into and out of the ice ages. Um, that's a huge change in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, change of about 100 meters of sea level, you know, kilometer thick ice sheets over cities like New York. The difference between being in those ice ages and in these interglacial periods like now, it comes from a very incremental change in the amount of incoming radiation from the sun as the orbit of the earth slightly changes. But those very small effects that we can just outright quantify the change in temperature that would result from that much change in radiation are able to explain a tiny fraction of the total observed change. And the rest we can figure out by, well, basically doing the accounting for the rest of the change we observe and then doing some modeling, and other sorts of studies. We have pinned that on these nonlinear features in the climate system that you tip it a little, you nudge it a little bit and it'll really act up. So those are also things we should be afraid of um, for sure that could have this larger destructive potential. Right. I mean, there's examples that are ongoing right now. For instance, the wildfires in Australia that are literally wiping out 
whole species or close to wiping out whole species. And, you know, there's lots of coral bleaching that's going on, which then makes it really difficult for marine life to rebound. I, I saw on Twitter the other day that in Florida and certain places, it's so hot that it's literally raining iguanas. Like iguanas are falling out of the trees because they're overheating. Like when you leave your cell phone out in the sun for too long and it overheats, this is basically what's happening to iguanas. And they're not oftentimes, sometimes they're dead, but sometimes they just like can't move because they're so hot. And because they're cold blooded, they're not as, as good at regulating their body temperature. It's like, this is not normal. These are not normal phenomena for Earth to experience. And it does like make you think, you know, is there some point of no return or some point by which it just becomes really difficult to restore the natural environment? You know, same thing with what's going on in the Amazon, where they are intentionally clearing acres and acres of this old growth rainforest so that they can have more land for livestock which is, you know, like we said, 60% of all mammals are livestock. So we're decreasing biodiversity even more. And then, you know, let's say one day there's some virus as that, ha that, you know, gets all the cows. And because there's so little genetic diversity and because we've chalked them full of all these growth hormones that, that may have like weird effects as far as their natural resistance to, you know, viruses, like we could be putting ourselves into a really dangerous corner by having so few potential animals and you know so few of the you know natural safeguards that the environment has against you know any sort of runaway extinction event um, yeah i would say that it, in a way it we are vulnerable if we are inducing large changes in the earth system and then trying to basically keep up with the pace or manage the pace um it's a very complicated system to just take the helm of. We do not understand the rule book nearly well enough to say that we can just take over from here um, and keep the balance just right. So that would be a, a, a very touchy situation to end up in where we are really trying to pull all the levers to balance the climate system. And that's definitely at, at forefront of research right now is identifying these tipping points beyond which you know, this incremental increase of CO2 might initiate these nonlinear feedbacks um, in, in the worst case, maybe leading to greater greenhouse gas emissions from natural processes. Um, so I would say that bearing that in mind, it's important to uh, that just, I don't know, it helps me think about these climate goals that we set, for instance, and you say, well, why does it matter that we have, you know, two or two and a half degrees or three degrees of warming. What's the difference? Those are very small, but these can be different thresholds for certain um, processes. And so you know, being more conservative in that approach could, could only help likely. Yeah. So I want to just ask one more question and then we can get into the future scenarios. And that is, assuming we are able to do it scientifically, should we bring back the woolly mammoth or any other species that have gone extinct or may go extinct. Like let's say the African elephant goes extinct. Would it make sense to bring back the African element elephant? And just to set the groundwork, you know, I listened to a pretty interesting debate where one side was arguing for bringing back animals and one side was arguing against. And there seemed to be good points on both sides. Like the ones who want to bring back the woolly mammoth, for instance, they argue that by introducing certain keystone species, like how we reintroduced wolves in Yellowstone and they helped cull the population of deer and then that allowed more of the plants to regrow because so, they weren't getting overeaten and it just really helped the overall environment. Similar arguments have been made for bringing back the woolly mammoth and putting them in some of these areas like in Siberia and Northern Russia and Canada where they can then sort of use their tusks to aerate the soil and their dung will sort of fertilize the soil and they'll sort of bring back this more, uh, you know, this, this better sort of environment. But obviously there are all these concerns about should we really play God in this sense and isn't it better to just preserve the species that are still around 
could there be unintended consequences? Like maybe there will be new viruses that are brought back from the dead and maybe there's a reason these species went extinct and who are we to meddle with it? So I'm curious where you stand on this issue. You know, without being particularly well read in the, the mammoth case itself, I just think as a general rule, I would maybe tend towards the preservation and conservation of what we have in our current ecosystems before doing the things as drastic as revival, uh, reviving these species that are recently extinct, partially because it's easy, like we were just talking about, the complexity in this, you know, in the ecological balance of systems is often beyond that which we understand. And you see cases where we tried to do something well-intentioned and founded in scientific understanding that still go wrong because we have their pieces of the ecological balance we get wrong. And there are some cases where uh, this is well-documented in island settings that are basically you know, microcosms of what's happening on a global uh, or continental scale and other places where there's a certain infestation of one invasive species is taking over and everyone says, we need to get rid of this. And you bring in this other species that is a natural predator for that. And you say, this makes a lot of sense. This will help call the population of that one species. And then the other one you bring in invades and it actually gets rid of some of the other species you want. And it's a it's very- like that old nursery rhyme, like she swallowed the spider to catch the fly and then you have to swallow <laughs> something else to catch the spider. <laughs> yeah, it's it can quickly become that sort of a game. And, since we are in a situation where we cannot do all of the things we need to be doing, I think since we have to be doing, you know, doing some triage here, I think we should focus our attention on conserving, preserving what does exist um, right now. It's just my initial reaction to that. Not that it wouldn't be cool to have woolly mammoths around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then one other question comes to mind also just before the future scenarios, and that is we typically think about will humans go extinct? But we never or we hardly ever consider the possibility of will humans evolve, speciate into a new species that may then displace the current Homo sapiens species. So rather than us just ending or going on forever in the way we exist right now, physiologically, could we speciate and what would cause that, given that now it's, it's very different than the way animals would speciate in the past where, you know, for instance, it took, I think, like five to eight million years for the ancestor of both humans and chimps to speciate into humans and chimps. And a lot of that was due to geologic isolation. You'd have different environmental inputs. Only the fit beings within that environment would survive. But obviously now we're all sort of mixed together. And whether you're rich or poor or smart or physically strong or physically weak, you, you can kind of, everyone can still reproduce. So I'm curious if, if you have thoughts around, are we still evolving? And could we evolve to the point where a new species emerges and perhaps even takes the place of Homo sapiens? Yeah, so I think the important distinction to draw there is what is uh, speciation and, and by definition just biologically speaking that's when a single population that is reproductive uh, openly within that population splits into two groups that one does not reproduce with the other that is when you become different species and in the history of life on earth this is often driven by geographic isolation so that you just cannot mix the populations because if you're in the same place you're going to reproduce so that's just the most effective way to ensure that's not happening. There are other ways where you can temporal isolation where some become nocturnal and some do. Um, but what we have, like you were just saying, the way that our world is mixed with, as far as humans, where people travel the earth, they, people are intermarrying across groups of humans that never would have come in contact before. Um, the world's getting smaller in that way. If anything, there's a homogenization going on. Um, you could say. And so in order to drive a speciation, it would basically require the isolation reproductively of some subset of humans, uh, which you could, it's maybe harder to imagine that being geographically driven right now, but um, maybe you could envision that could happening culturally economically, yeah. culturally. Um, that That's plausible, I guess. Uh, and short of that, maybe something 
some weird technological change uh, where you know it's not even analogous to what we do with our more squishy chemical existence right now and we start to incorporate merge more with the uh the world of chips and bits so uh, short of that i think we're in fact headed maybe on a trajectory of homogenizing across the species right now interesting awesome i think that's a good place to move into the future scenarios What is your worst case scenario for the future of extinction? Worst case scenario. Yeah, the worst case for me at this point is to see this current rate of extinction and current rate of environmental change that we're wreaking um, to just continue to increase at the rate that it is basically so that we're going to be with each coming year extinguishing more species and increasing the CO2 level in the atmosphere by even more. Um, and this sort of runaway effect will undoubtedly lead to some nonlinear feedbacks being initiated in the climate system, whether that comes in a decade, a few decades, or a century. The worst case that I could imagine would be one where humans sow the seeds of the demise of not just all these other species on Earth, but really of ourselves perhaps too. Um, and what we would be left with in that worst case is a true mass extinction event of the magnitude that would be recognized in the geologic record. Um, so I think it's within reach enough to say that's my worst case. It could happen, um, but it would require a pretty, pretty bad um, behavior on the part of humans, not not working really to change our trajectory by any means. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would have a similar answer as far as the extinction of other species. And it's almost, it's worrisome because in the worst case scenario, it's basically we just keep doing what we've been doing. And whenever that's the case on this podcast, it's extra worrisome because it requires specific concerted action to avoid the worst case. It's not like we have to have some, you know, extraterrestrials come and, and kill us. Like we're already killing ourselves uh, just by what we're doing, even if it's a slow, you know, gradual death. And so, yeah, my worst case scenario as far as other animals is that with our kids and our grandkids, that they think of rhinos and elephants and tigers in sort of the same way that we think of like dinosaurs and giant sloths and megafauna, where they're sort of like animals of a bygone past and they're not really around except for maybe in zoos and like you said we've cornered the wild animals to the extent that there's just so little amount of space for them to thrive i mean i've i read that cheetahs there's only like a few hundred cheetahs or something on earth because they need so much space to roam around and there's just simply not that much space left for them to roam around so a lot of the coolest species, like the ones that we decorate our you know, baby's nursery rooms with, and there's a reason we do that, because we feel connected to these other apex predators, that those will be lost. And so that's my worst case scenario as far as other species. Um, as far as for our own species, there are lots of ways we could go extinct, but it's worth considering that it'd be really hard to wipe out every single human just because there are so many of us and because we're so adaptable. So even if there was some tipping point and we weren't able to feed everyone, or even if there was some global nuclear war, some people would probably survive. We have bunkers deep in mountains in Denver. We have a base in Antarctica. We've got astronauts on the International Space Station. Like, it would be really hard to wipe out every single human being on planet Earth all at once, whether it's nuclear war, whether it's a bioengineered pandemic, um, whether it's some sort of ecological collapse. So in my worst case scenario for humans, I actually think the only way that we could likely wipe out every single human would be either AI, something that's intelligent enough that it could actually locate every human and systematically wipe it out like some sort of utility function, 
or it could be extraterrestrials like any species that's more intelligent than us that could just like scan the planet find every human and wipe them out or the one that is actually probably the most worrisome to me is omnicide which is if you have some super powerful person or government that just decides to kill everyone and they have the technology to do it and you know nick bostrom raises this argument of imagine that everyone on planet earth has a kill switch where they could just press a button and the whole world would blow up how many people would hit that button it's not zero right it's 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 definitely it might be zero when you round it to the nearest percentage point but just given how many humans there are there are probably at least thousands of humans that would be willing to hit that kill switch whether it's for you know mistaken religious beliefs or just because they're a crazy sociopath or whatever so as technology progresses it does seem like there could be more and more potential kill switches that are developed or as nick bostrom calls black or balls that you could pull from the urn of invention and you know so it seems like omnicide like basically new ways that we could kill everyone including ourselves would be my worst case scenario just because the other scenarios whether it's asteroid or nuclear war seem unlikely to kill every single human um, yeah well let's let's move it on to the best case scenario so in your best case scenario what steps would humanity take to avoid the worst case of the sixth extinction best case scenario yeah the best case is honestly not that optimistic even for me because we can do a lot to in the best case you know, follow these uh, rules of climate agreements and carefully manage ecosystems, um, maybe even uh, do things like assisted relocation of species that are seeing their optimal range move. Because even if we stopped emitting CO2 right now, there's warming that's still going to occur in the climate system. Species are going to have to relocate slightly or, or a lot. Um, and if we really just, if we made this like our main goal, we would still see a lot of species loss. Um, but in doing that, I think we could definitely end up in a point where we did not hit a true mass extinction event, one that would be recognizable in the geologic record. We wouldn't have uh, taken out the underpinnings of our you know, food webs uh, to, the, to the root. So in doing that, we could basically, we still wouldn't be living in the world as we inherited it, um, but we could avoid hitting any of these tipping points where things might start to get a little out of control. And in doing that, we basically have a more stable, perhaps predictable world within which to live and operate, allowing human you know, civilization to continue to develop and tinker with invention and exploration of our planet and beyond and all of these things that we want to do without having to worry about our very survival. Um, so in that best case, I think it requires a very concerted effort um, uh, internationally, too, because the, like when we've talked about climate change as an imminent threat um, to our planet, the, these are not things that a single country can do, even if a few countries have disproportionate um, footprints on this. Um, it, it spans national borders for sure. Right. Yeah, that resonates with me. I would say in my best case, one of the solutions I like the most is basically saying 30% of Earth is just for wild animals and just marking off some big portion of Earth to just be pure wilderness. And obviously that's really difficult to do on an international agreement basis. It's like who's going to give up their land and all that. But let's say we were able to achieve that then we could sort of have a safe part of Earth that could continue to evolve in a natural way and have enough biodiversity that that could be, you know, we depend on biodiversity for many reasons. And it's not only for, you know, pharmaceuticals and medical research, but there are just so many uses for taking all of the variety that life has come up with and, you know, using it to make sure we have a healthy existence and a healthy planet. 
So if we were able to dedicate some good portion of Earth to wildlife through national parks, but you know, on a much grander scale, that would be phenomenal. And it does seem like with technology and the way it's going, it is now possible to live in basically a wild setting while still having the amenities of modern life. Like you can just, you don't need to put concrete over every every land surface on earth to get around. Now you can just fly a helicopter or maybe like autonomous drones or you can do tunnels and uh, with the boring company. And so there are all of these ways now where we can actually live with the environment rather than dominating and bulldozing the environment. So I'm hopeful that even though it seems like a long shot right now, as technology progresses and as people start to wake up to the reality of this extinction, then we may take the proper steps to live with the environment rather than just simply dominate the environment. Um, well, let's bring it home to the most likely scenario. So what is your most likely projection for how the future of extinction will play out? Most likely scenario. You know, as with, I guess, our discussions of the future of climate and the way that humanity is going to respond to that threat, I think we'll see a similar thing here where it's going to take some some bad things to happen and some proximity to uh, the centers of gravity and the governments and the you know, ruling bodies that can actually initiate this change. There's going to have to be some things that are hitting close to home uh, to really see some, some action here. Um, so exactly how that will manifest, hard to say. I think, if anything, this will it'll be largely interwoven, though, with the, the larger discourse on climate policy. And if we start to see catastrophic events, um, things that are hurting our cities or things that are wiping out critical uh, pieces of the ecological balance that are required to maintain our agricultural yields or um, even, I don't know, it could be industries like tourism or something that is financially extremely important somewhere. Um, if the loss of biodiversity is creating an economic loss, then people might start to take it seriously. Um, <laughs> That's so but sad. The, the problem, <laughs> it's really sad. And the, the worrisome thing about that is exactly this point of these nonlinear feedbacks is that once you wait that long, maybe there will be some of these tipping points crossed where you are uh, fighting much more uphill battle to avoid the worst following consequences. Um, maybe not, it, that, I really can't say off the cuff, but based on my knowledge, how worried we should be about that exact situation, but it, it definitely leaves us vulnerable to that possibility, I would say. Yeah, I think you're right that until it hits our wallets, it's hard for people to care or governments to care as much or companies to care as much about what's happening to the environment. And so I think you're right. Either it's something major happens that affects our economic conditions that then leads to action, or it might be the case that as the younger people sort of take over control, like the Greta Thunbergs of the world sort of come to power, then it might just naturally become a policy that's popular among young people and popular among the majority of voters. So I'm also hopeful for that. However, that also requires just time. And it's like every decade that we put, kick this can down the road, it just makes it that much worse. And it's not like it's just worse by a decade. It's exponentially worse because even if we stop today, like you said, there will still be warming. There will still be more and more species lost. So we really should be doing everything we can to restore the health of our environment. And I guess as far as my most likely scenario for humanity and whether humans may go extinct, I think that th so there's a couple interesting statistical models for how long will humans continue to live. One basically takes the assumption that we, you know, we're just in some normal time of 
as a normal observer. So we're probably somewhere in the middle of the bell curve. And that basically amounts to, we probably have between 9,000 and 9 million years left before we go extinct, just based on like how long we've been around with like a confidence interval. But that's just based on how many years humans have been around. Another mathematical model is that based on how many humans there are, we may have much less time than that because there are so many humans right now that, and so many humans that potentially have access to nuclear weapons and, and that kind of thing that we may actually have far less time than we think. So those are the different mathematical models, but of course it's really hard to pin that down. If I had to say what I thought was most likely, I think humanity will end up surviving even amidst the collapse of many other species and we will continue to progress. I think eventually we're going to figure out fusion energy and we're going to figure out how to get sustainable energy and have totally biodegradable materials and we're no longer going to need to pollute the earth in the same way. And this may take some major mass extinction uh, to occur before we get this right, but I do believe we will get to the point where we learn how to live with Earth's environment in a way that's mutually beneficial for us and for other species on the planet. I do think we will be driven to near extinction some, sometime in the next thousand years. I think it's unlikely that we're just going to you know, keep around the like 10 billion mark for the next thousand years. I think it's likely going to go way down and then we're going to be a lot smarter about how we operate as far as uh, with ourselves in the environment. And then I think, you know, hopefully we are able to even go multiplanetary. And even when the sun expands to engulf the Earth, by that point, not only have we gone to Mars, but we've gone to some other planets like Europa and, you know, places that might be more hospitable even than Mars. And if we live beyond that, you know, at a certain point, even Mars and Europa are going to be engulfed by the expanding sun. And so maybe then we'll figure out how to live amongst neutron stars, which are like collapsed stars that live for way longer. And then maybe the final, the final place where humanity could live would be around black holes, where maybe we can steal some of the energy from black holes. And so it is pretty incredible to think that we could live for a very, very long time if we figure out the technology right and if we don't screw up the resources we have, especially early on. And I think also as far as the human evolution piece, I was surprised to find that evolution is actually accelerating among humans. It's not decelerating. And it, it, you're right that it is the case that there is sort of a homogenization from the perspective of there's a lot more inter, you know, marrying of people from different sides of the globe and different backgrounds. But because of all this mixing, and because there are so many different places where humans live in different environments, uh, biologists have seen that we are now coming up with new resistances to certain diseases in certain parts of the world. And one X factor that we hadn't talked about is the potential for bioengineering, where you can essentially choose what genes your child has. And that to me seems more likely that we'll actually do that than we just won't ever do it, especially if other countries start to do it like China and then it becomes a competition thing. And then you could have like sort of this like super class in society that has all of the best genes. And those people are likely to just naturally be attracted to reproducing with other super beings with the best genes. And that may spark a new sort of evolution and maybe it does end up somehow merging with machines where you can just have brain machine interfaces that allow you to be way more productive, way more wealthy, have more kids, give your kids a better chance at a better future. And we could evolve to some superior being and then normal humans may go the way of the dodo. So it sounds crazy to say those things, but it's also hard to challenge any one of those assumptions that like we will just not try this crazy new technology that seems like it has a lot of potential advantages for people wanting to try it. And if that happens, you know, that would lead to its own sort of evolution. So there's a lot to discuss and it's too, more than we can handle on this one podcast. 
but I did want to thank you for joining this and sharing your knowledge, Kip, on evolution and extinction and hopefully giving people not only a sense of the potential doomsday, but also a glimmer of hope that we can, you know, really change things and build a better world for the future and maybe live to the point where we get to see the end of the, you know, the heat death of the cosmos in our little homes by the black hole. And <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you uh, having me on to discuss all that. And I am glad to uh, always hear your most optimistic and perhaps realistic outlooks of what we could expect. So it's definitely something to hold out hope for. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for listening. This has been the future of extinction. And we'll see you next time. The past, the present.